So I gave the first one of the first seminar, CAES seminar series paper looking at the complexities of providing evidence to inform policy, which kind of looked at a lot of the, um, the challenges and some of the difficulties and how we might come around those. So I'm really pleased that today we're looking at how to make better use of evidence in public policy making. So it's, it's a more positive perspective that Jonathan's going to offer. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to, um, to Jonathan. Uh, I should say that we are a partnership between the Economic and Social Research Council, the UK's premier body for social science, uh, the Big Lottery Fund, again a UK body, really interested in charities raising their game in terms of evidence and their own impact, using learning from others, really delivering this more or less agenda. And finally, Nesta, uh, which was, by the way, one of these bodies that was spun out of government. We're, uh, we're hosted in Nesta, which is the UK's innovation body. Uh, I don't think we saved money, but we certainly brought in lots of external funding from overseas, with like Bloomberg, Philanthropies, Rockefeller, and so forth. So I think that's another way of earning, earning money and getting more for less. Go and get people who, who have more money, like the Americans. Um, but I want to talk about the evidence ecosystem. What's really transformed uh, over the last few years is, can you see this in the back? Can you see the writing? I can talk you through. This is a picture to show, I'll talk you through, don't worry. This is a picture to show uh, the institutions and intermediaries that are out there to help you. So not only are uh, on the right, on the red here, you can see it's red, the outside wobbly sausage, as our designers call it, are all those government bodies that do great work getting research evidence to help decision makers. So of course, Kesson's there, Razor's in there. Please check this out. This is an infographic that you can dig down into and find all these institutions. It's multi-level. Uh, do have a look at this if you're interested. So you've got the right, this red outside <coughs> sausage of government players. Uh, and then what you've got in the inside, in the middle here, the orange, is uh, the orange internal sausage is the what work centres. Are you, are you familiar with the what work centres? They're not very well known about Okay. So there are nine of these centres that um, are there to synthesise research in a way that's useful to you, that's actionable. Uh, so often in the past we had surveys from civil servants and politicians saying, I can't even access the research, it's hidden behind uh, you know, paywalls, it's all gobbledygook. They always summarise it by, we need to do more research. Uh, I'll be here to do that, you know, you'll do that. But these nine work, work centres are really going to bring the research together in a way that's helpful to you. They're thematic, there's ones in crime and education. Uh, there's one in Scotland and Wales, and we're going to talk about Northern Ireland later on. But they are incredibly helpful because they're freely available research, synthesising massive bodies of systematic reviews of evidence in a way that you can determine, does that work or not? Is it value for money? However, as well as those nine what work centres, there's this yellow bit here, which is another real strength of the UK evidence and case system. Universities, no-brainer. Fantastic universities, as we see with KESS, but also all those bodies around them. There are lots of sort of policy labs. Uh, everyone wants to have their own think tank attached to a university. There are also many independent research organisations that have summaries of research freely available that you can access. People like Campbell Collaboration, Dieting to Social Research Unit, freely available for you to use at any time. So do have a look at this, it's on our website, and it shows an incredibly strong ecosystem. And to give one example of the what work centres, this is the education. It's the Education Endowment Foundation. And they have a toolkit that brings together decades worth of research on what works in the classroom. It's useful for teachers, parents, governors, policy makers involved in putting money where they think the most impact will be. And what's great about it is you can get it in seconds. So you've got types of intervention that work in the, uh, in the school. Some it's quite controversial. Performance pay. 
has very little impact on educational outcomes. It doesn't actually help our students. It might make teachers feel sane and stay in the system, but there's that really awkward evidence of it doesn't actually help in terms of our pupils. And you can do it by the strength of evidence, this line here, or you can do it how much time it will save you in the classroom by implementing this intervention, and even value for money. Some of the most effective things, going back to the more for less, are actually really cheap. Something called metacognition or uh, technical thing. But getting your peers, other teachers, to watch how you teach and give feedback. Very cheap, terrifying if you're a teacher, but immensely effective in improving your services, according to the global evidence. But what do we mean by research evidence? What's actually useful to you? Not for us in academia, but what's actually useful to you out there? Here you go, here's some research evidence. You know, everything from uh, regression discontinuity analysis, you know, to, okay, okay, you've got something. Uh, things you've probably heard about, like surveys or pilot studies, randomized controlled trials. But this is not a good way to engage with really busy decision makers, people running charities, they don't want this. So we have a model. We have a model which is much simpler, a five-stage standards of evidence. Uh, it's been used by Nesta in terms of how they fund social programs. Uh, something called Project Oracle, which is a crime reduction initiative in London, uh, funded by Boris Johnson. He's not usually interested in evidence unless it's classical Roman history, but his officials are interested in social science and understanding what can work to reduce crime and um, and youth. What this model does is really simple, and that's its beauty. It starts from a basic level one of, do you even know what you're trying to do? Do you have a theory of change? Logic models or something that's called. Extraordinary how many people get money or have a program, and they don't actually know how they're going to have an impact. They don't know how they're going to get from where they are now to improving public services for outcomes for their citizens. So really simple level one. Level two, collecting data. Level three is comparison routes. Can you compare, can you start to make attributions about causality? That sounds techy, geeky. It's actually the hardest and possibly the most important thing when you're talking about the impact of our programs. And I'll give you an example. So often we find uh, in things like crime reduction programs, that police officers, politicians, people who want the best say, my program is working, I can show I've made a difference. And we've seen this with a, a Peace and Crime Commission in Wales. He said, I've got to show that my programs make a difference. And then you show the comparison group. You show the comparison group that did also show a reduction in crime, but at exactly the same level. So can you really claim you made a difference if in the wider societal level or a meaningful comparison it wasn't really different. So I'm sorry it's quite geeky but it's really important we find that again and again people making overclaim not having the integrity they should. Do you really know that works compared to comparison group? So that's a hard one and the dream in level fours and fives are multiple replications i.e. tried it out in different areas. How often do we see in our papers front page news of and they're eating five day fruits. I've got great examples of completely contradictory single studies showing five, five day fruits will make you live 50 years longer. Five day fruit has no impact. Coffee, wine. We need multiple studies in multiple places, particularly perhaps if you're just doing something just in Belfast. Does that work in the rest of Northern Ireland? Does that work in other rich countries? We have to do multiple replications. So this is a model. It's been tried by the Cabinet Office, <coughs> Nesta, Project Oracle, <coughs> the Big Lottery Fund. It has many critics. Very simplistic. I was a critic. Uh, I thought we commissioned one of the best critiques of these models. I'm now the other extreme. I'm a zealot for some kind of model for making a judgment on what works when it comes to impact. But even when you've got that high quality evidence, how do you use it? What is the best way to go about using it? Um, 
That is from, you recognise that film? You ever seen this film? It's Filled with Dreams, Build It and They Would Come, cheesy Hollywood film uh, with Kevin Costner. I find so often with evidence, people feel that it's going to talk to them, it's going to talk for itself. Build a research portal on what works on them. Magically, your decision makers will turn up and use it. Uh, in my work with Kevin Costner, building a baseball park in the middle of Idaho, wherever the hell it was, um, but it was even some magical realist film. In the real world, you're going to have to sell our evidence, <coughs> make it relevant to your context, timely. How often, I got something from the Treasury a couple of weeks ago before the spending review. Oh, can you give us five examples of evidence that save money uh, by lunchtime? Okay, that's how it works. How to do it? I've been mean, mad lots of, I don't know where it went to, it was part of the, the spending review narrative, whatever the hell that means. Um, it's probably a 12 year old spad in, in, in the Treasury. I don't know. But that's what we have to deal with making our evidence relevant, timely, and useful. Dissemination is dead, okay? We can't just pump it out the door. We need to have interactivity, which is why KESS is great. So much of the evidence is about things like trust, having what's called change agents, i.e. people fronting things up. Uh, we can't just pump it out the door. Ignore the toolkits. Here's some toolkits about how to get evidence out there. Uh, I'm systematically ignoring those, even though one of them I have to write to these come from the Department for International Development, the European Commission. Everyone thinks they know how research gets up, but actually the, the research evidence is of how we get research into the research. It's the kind of evidence and evidence question. It is much more mixed, uh, much more challenging. Uh, we're actually doing a systematic review of all the research evidence funded by the Wellcome Trust. Uh, on all the ways that are most effective to get research into practice. And it's hard, but don't use the toolkits by the great and the good and the, um, you think they've got it sorted out. It's much harder than that. And what we certainly have to do is be real about the different sorts of knowledge and skills of civil servants and decision makers. This model is have you, anyone ever seen this? I've never found a civil servant certainly have seen this, but in the UK civil servant apparently should know about it. It's the UK civil service uh, policy profession skills and knowledge framework. Yeah, obviously. Um, and it is a good model because it shows that the dream decision maker is a mixture of evidence, delivery skills, how often do things fail when it comes to the delivery unit, and it's of actually getting into practice, not a high level policy, and politics. Not just capital P politics, but how might be managing the politics of departments and all the other things with the stakeholders. And then model after model that follows this sort of Venn diagram, where we want something in the middle here, somebody who's savvy about not just evidence, that would be a disaster. Now, China's brilliant at being evidence based because they just roll things through regardless of what local like system is. Uh, we need people who are aware of the politics and are delivering just as much as evidence. That's what we're trying to do. We also want the culture, this is a really hard, of encouraging experimentation. Uh, there is a risk aversion for so many people. I'm guilty of this. I have my funders. We say we can try things out. I'm part of actually a big lottery fund grant called Accelerating Ideas, it's supposed to be about failure and experimentation, trying things out, learning to see if they work, if they don't, moving on and adapting. We can't always plough ahead with the old ways. We do need to try new things out if we're going to find out that works. So having that culture of experimentation is vital. But also being aware that we're human beings with loads of cognitive biases. By that I mean those conscious or unconscious uh, things we walk around with so that even when we want to do the best, even when we want to apply research and practice, it's biased. And here's a sort of list of some of the 150 well-evidenced cognitive biases that any decision maker, whether an Israeli fighter pilot, a surgeon, a civil servant, a nurse, 
makes again and again. We have to be aware of these when we're thinking about bringing research evidence into policy and practice. Uh, halo effect. This every politician knows about this. This is about we know somebody because they look attractive, because they're of a certain gender. We think that what they're saying is much better than somebody who doesn't have that halo effect. Okay. Uh, really well evidenced, very depressing, it's where all those sort of uh, gender biases come in and so forth. We also know about optimism bias. There's actually a treasury guidebook, the Green Book, that shows, gives you a, a way of measuring how biased, how biased you are, you think your new program is going to be in terms of the future, and try to discount it. Because we do it systematically. We, all, we are too optimistic. We have a terrible optimism bias. We always think things are going to be better than they are. Uh, it's just human nature. Unless you're depressed, uh, then optimism bias less so. Then realism bias and, and depression. Uh, but my favourite one of these is the, the final one, the co metacognitive bias. I have a bias that we don't even think of bias. We think we're rational and empirical, <coughs> but we're not. Not just politicians, we all have these everyday biases, and we need to work with the brain. <coughs> but finally, I'm going to pass over to a very specific uh, interest in what works in the line. I don't know about you, but I do think at times we undersell ourselves. We have this Noah Myers sort of trait that you know, to sometimes disparage or not recognise what we're good at. So, I mean, what, what I find as we go around you know, the evidence ecosystem is you know, how much good stuff we churn out. We may not disseminate it as well, we may not probably get it to the, the real people who can use the evidence, but we do put out a lot of very useful stuff. Now how can we make that stuff more relevant? Well, a very interesting study done by Carnegie UK Trust two years ago, Jim McCormick, he looked at the exchange of evidence across the UK, and for Northern Ireland there were some quite worrying trends. One, the good thing we do produce good quality stuff, and our researchers are generally top notch. But in the UK exchange, um, there are mechanisms that actually inhibit the effective take-up of research. And for Northern Ireland, well, there was real desire from researchers to link up, particularly with the Welsh and Scottish jurisdictions. We're not able to get out of our bubble. And also, quite surprisingly, there are a real lack of contact with colleagues in Ireland, in Southern Ireland, the Republic. The sort of historical connections that perhaps researchers and academics uh, you know, peer to peer networks. They seem to be breaking down for younger, younger um, researchers. Maybe that's linked to reductions in conference budgets and inability for people to make face to face contact. So, across the UK, there seems to be a real breakdown in the exchange of evidence. And part of our mission is to try and look at ways in which we can re establish, in some cases, but also create new forms of digital interaction ways in which we can use evidence much more effectively. And for Northern Ireland, there's no doubt we are missing one important leg, as Jonathan pointed out earlier, and this is the growth of network <coughs> centres across the UK. Now, these are meant to be a genuinely UK-wide exchange mechanism, but we just make a basic point. If there isn't one in Northern Ireland, well, I'm afraid it's not working with the UK of also, these, these work well, WWCs, are meant to showcase or bring to the world the results of our research. It really highlights research excellence to a global audience. Now, again, Northern Ireland is missing out there because we don't have that platform. So one thing that we'd be interested to hear you know, in the, in the Q&A after this is, do you think a What Works Centre could work in Northern Ireland? If so, what could it be? focus on? Could it be thematic in a way that education and policing, well-being for example, have rolled out? Or should it be more like the Scottish and Welsh models which are very organically linked to the executive, very closely aligned with parliamentary programmes of government, parliamentary goals, the business of government? And we think the Welsh one perhaps is something of particular scrutiny because it's very small, tightly focused Public, Poli Public Policy Institute that works with academia, the third sector, and government in terms of producing useful evidence for the important business, the nitty-gritty, dirty business of public policy making. So 
finally a play from us, and that is we can get this gizmo to work, and that is to join us. We produce an avalanche of evidence out there, lots of blogs, lots of studies. We link up with over two and a half thousand policy champions uh, across the world. It's free membership. What we do is just uh, on our website, log in, uh, sign up, and you know, hopefully you'll join us as part of this champion of the use of, of evidence in policy making. So thank you for your attention.